Hello and welcome back to the weekend program here on RHAP. Welcome back to The Attic. I'm Josh Wiggler. I'm joined here by my partner in crime as always, the great AC Mazzaro, Antonio Mazzaro. Antonio, I couldn't bear to wait podcasting with you for a second week in a row. Well, I was going to ask you what crimes we were going to be partners in, but I see now the crimes are against humor words jokes <laughs> well we've been waging society a free for a decade in that regard Antonio. fair enough it's a good point it's a very yeah. good point we're gonna be podcasting from the booth pretty soon that's what i call jail the booth <laughs> that's a along a, a, a list of many aliases the old gray bar hotel the who scow the booth the, the, the booth. big house i'm coming out of the booth well we are so happy that so many of you have come out of the booth to join the us in the here. attic here on the weekend program we heard so many great notes from you uh as of uh last week when we released our first episode so thank you for all the kind words keep them coming we can program rhap at gmail.com is an easy way to get in touch with us weekend program rhap at gmail Dot com And of course, you want to make sure you're subscribed to this podcast so you never miss an episode of the weekend program. Rob has a website dot com slash subscribe. It's got all of the info for where to go to subscribe to this podcast, as well as where to watch it on YouTube on Saturday mornings. Rob has a website dot com slash subscribe. A reset on what the weekend program is here on We Know Scripted TV. Antonio is a TV hangout. Yeah. People are invited to come and hang out in the attic with you and I as we talk about TV every week. It's conversations we have, we have had, we all we will continue to have about this space that we know and love so much. Uh, we like to think about all the weird things about this space, about the, the ephemera, the weird things about shows. Of course, over at Post Show Recaps, we would always drill deep on the trivia or the very odd specific things that were referenced in the show. Uh, I think in this space, Josh, we're just talking about TV. We're talking about the medium. We're talking about how it started, where we are now, where we it's might go. broad canvas. Things we like about it, things we don't like about it, shows we like, shows we don't like, and shows we really, really, really like. Shows we love, That's as in one. the yeah. case of this week's topic. Uh, That's right. We are talking about flagship TV this week, Antonio, is the name of the game as you and I made our podcast bones is that a thing that you could say we made our we podcasted about bones once uh, we did <laughs> but we made our we made Only our pods we made our podcast bones we cut our podcast teeth on shows like better call saul on ted lasso on mr robot on the leftovers on justified on these shows that you and i deemed really meaty very thematically rich we would go episode by episode we had such a good time doing it we got old though we're old, Antonio. Speak for yourself. Speak for yourself. We're old now. Old TV McTeevsters back again here. Uh, missed my train. Uh, and we uh, just can't do it quite the same way. We can't do this episode by episode anymore. But from time to time, a show is going to come along that Antonio and I love so much that we will dedicate multiple podcasts to this show. Uh, and we have reached that first waypoint Quite early on, Antonio, this is the second week of the weekend program, and we are going all in on The Bear. That's FX is The Bear, FX on Hulu. It is the cooking show that's not a cooking show the way you think about it. It's a cooking drama. It's sort of, Antonio, I've been thinking about this a little bit. Yeah, it's kind of like me. Mr. Robot meets Top Chef. <laughs> Wow, I'm gonna have to have you say more about that, but I'm really just letting that sit for a minute uh, yeah. because of obviously the Top Chef vibes, we get it. Uh, the Mr. Robot vibes, interesting. Padma to me. locks me as my imaginary friend. Yeah. <laughs> How does I this healed, I healed that uh, problem, and she wasn't on this most recent season of Top Chef. So, <laughs> and then you stopped watching. <laughs> yeah, I was healed. I didn't need to keep going. You said goodbye, friend. Yeah, yeah. I said ciao, anyway, house. T yeah. Tell me where the Mr. Robot part comes in, because the Top Chef part of The Bear is obvious. It is a show about a restaurant. It's a show about fine dining uh, and about like the stress and the intensity. The whole thing feels like a quick fire at times yeah. so in terms of that level of stress. The Top Chef part, completely evident. Where do you feel the Mr. Robot part comes from on The Bear for you? 
I think we'll talk about it as we go deeper. Don't let uh don't let me forget that I said that. I'm sure you okay. won't. All right. All right. Um, but but let's let's set some stuff up off the top here. We are not talking about every single episode of The Bear. Even today, two seasons of The Bear are already out. You can watch all of them on Hulu. Uh, this is a show that drops all of its episodes at once. The first season was eight episodes. Second season it's is ten episodes. Uh, you can watch eighteen episodes of The Bear right now. As I am saying these words. On Saturday, June 22nd, on June 27th, the third season of The Bear drops in its entirety, which is why we're talking about it now. This is a bit of a what is The Bear and why should I watch it and why do we love it kind of a conversation, both for the initiated, I think, if you have watched The Bear, I hope that you are going to appreciate this conversation. And also, this is designed for people who have not yet taken the plunge. We are just right off the rip here. Let it rip, Antonio. We are both giving the bear our seal of approval, that Wiggler Mazzaro seal of approval. I've been Double saying stamp. offline all week that if this show had come out even like three years ago, this would have been one of those shows that you and I took apart episode by episode, beat by beat, and really made a meal of, if you'll forgive the pun. I think that's a good way of saying it rewards that kind of uh, viewing or analysis uh, or investment. Uh, and still, it is a binge show with shorter episodes. So it's a bit of a magic trick in that way, that it has the weight and feel of some of those shows that we spent so much time with, but it's just shorter run times. Uh, and it is not the same kind of engagement in some instances as far as total number of minutes spent watching, uh, just as a result of less episodes uh, and shorter episodes. And not only that, but the episodes are extremely fast paced at times uh, and highly stressful at times, especially up front in season one there. So it is uh, it is not like those shows in a lot of ways. And then in other ways, it's so much like them. It is a show that rewards those who are paying very close attention in the way that the best theory shows do sometimes. Uh, there are these recurring moments or recurring things that the camera lingers on. If you think about it, or if we spent some time talking about them, in the moment, uh, we might have been able to theorize where we were going with the bear uh, over the course of the first season. It is that kind of thing. Things are set up and rewarded. Uh, and sometimes things are set up for seasons uh, and have yet to be paid off. And we're looking forward to them in season three. So it is a show that really does reward in those ways. But it's its own beast. It's its own animal. It's a freaking bear for crying out loud. So it is not just that. Uh, it is also a very fast paced show and very much in its own way, a binge show, a show that feels worth watching like in, in sections and in chunks rather than episode by episode. So it's fascinating to think about it. There's that word I love using, uh, how this is different to those shows and also very similar to them. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's similar to a lot of the shows that we have talked about before. I want to give some like very quick, uh, high above the line selling points, uh, yeah, just please. some like top down views. Okay. So you get into the bear. This is some of the stuff that you should know going into it. It drops all at once, so you can binge a whole thing when a season shows up. It's short. And I'm saying, I don't know if you can hear Jeremy it. Allen White short. <laughs> well, a lot of the guys are a little short. It's like five, three, as a short saying. king myself, I'm always thrilled to see uh, some representation on the TV screen. Uh, it's short. And if you can't hear it, I'm smiling. I'm smiling as I say it's short. Antonio, the average episode length of The Bear. We determined this prior to the podcast. It's about 32 minutes and 30 seconds. If you Somewhere take out there. the longest episode of the show, which totally throws off the number. And if you take out the shortest episode of the show, uh, which is 20 minutes, there's a 20 minute episode of the bear. There's a 60 minute episode of the bear and it's closest peer clocks in at 47 minutes. There's one at 40 minutes and then everything else is underneath 40 minutes. They're short. You can watch it fast. My kingdom for a quick show, Antonio. Let me put just a little bit of an interesting twist on that, too, when I say, and I think you'll agree with me on this, the shortest episode and the longest episode are also the two most stressful episodes of the show. Yeah, without a doubt. Excruciate. So they managed to do that in the shortest one and the longest one. Yes. Uh, it's the kind of show that can pull that off. Uh, the show is impeccably made. It's in, it's fantastically edited. One of the best edited shows I've ever seen on television, personally, uh, yes. I, I would say. Uh, just incredible montages, sequences, uh, the way that the show builds like emotion and vibe through the edits. Uh, it's just really, really well done. It's an exceptionally well written, conceptualized, edited Everything about the show, as far as how it's made, is very good on top of it being short. Uh, so it's short and sweet in that way. 
Yes. Uh, short and sweet, uh, sometimes salty, sometimes bitter. Sometimes, sometimes umami. Sometimes umami here oh, wow. on The Bear. <laughs> Another one of those crimes. As this is, as mentioned, if I'm calling it Mr. Robot meets Top Chef, the Mr. Robot bits remain unexplained. But Top Chef, the Top Chef part is very evident, uh, most in common with Top Chef Chicago, I would say. Yeah, uh, as no Richard Blaze, though. This is, uh, not yet. This is a show that, uh, that not only is set in Chicago, but is set in the restaurant world of Chicago and is very much a restaurant show. If you know anything about The Bear, you know this is the chefy show. This is the show where people call each other cousin and behind and hands and heard chef and yes chef and no chef and all these other things that are getting screamed out of the kitchen as delightful goods delicious foods and sometimes disastrous meals are being concocted if you are a food person if you love food on tv another thought that i sent to antonio earlier this week is I think that the people who made the bear uh, should be the heirs apparent uh, to the Bourdain empire. I think that these are the people that once the bear is done, send these folks out into the universe, let them do what they do on the bear to the rest of the world. Show me other cities. There's one episode set in Copenhagen that having been there is such a love letter to Copenhagen. Like they need to make a travel show when this show is done. But for now, they have a lot of that incredible prestige travel TV instincts alive and well all over the bear. So if that sounds juicy and good to you, uh, that's because it is. The bear is juicy and good. And again, uh, as Josh is pointing out, they go to Copenhagen for basically an entire episode. It's the kind of show that can do that, that doesn't just rely on like one setting, like one kitchen at one restaurant, uh, but that can take you literally all over the world uh, for both its inspiration and showing the perspiration of the characters, what they get up to. It really is a show that covers such a broad swath of the things that impact uh, these characters' lives. We could do a flashback episode, which we do, of course, in many instances on the show, uh, go back in time in some of their lives uh like we said we can go to copenhagen uh the possibilities for a third season are seemingly endless in this regard even though it is a heavily chicago show uh and there's so much in the show about how not the related to the chicago fire universe not not related to the chicago pd chicago fire also not related to the musical chicago no. uh nothing going on in here but they do uh, give you the old razzle dazzle from time to time on the they, they do razzle dazzle them they do yeah. razzle dazzle them that's right yeah that, that's absolutely correct that does happen uh but yeah it's a show that is a chicago show it is a love letter to chicago in so many ways and music and soundtrack and delivery they they have the djs from a local chicago station on there to provide local color at one point uh it has a lot Wilco, of chicago in it of an course. iconic chicago band is all over the soundtrack in very important emotional ways Oh, the soundtrack in and of itself is like a Gen X dream. Like, I don't even know how else to put it, uh, but if you are Gen X or have an appreciation for Gen X music, like, this is your jam. Yeah. Uh, because it's, like, phenomenal. Is how Season is two as... kicking off with some Bruce Hornsby, and I'm just like, oh, man, take me down to the Harbor Lights. Are you kidding? Yeah. Uh, this is incredible. Uh, and I had to look up for a minute because I don't, I, I, I have a, a real fond attachment to a lot of Bruce Hornsby, but I don't know much about him as an artist. So That's just the way it is. There's <laughs> things will never be the same. Uh, there was a moment, Antonio, where I had to Google uh, Bruce Hornsby. I was like, is he like to Chicago what Bruce Springsteen is to New Jersey? And as far <laughs> as I could find out, Bruce Hornsby had no, has no real like major clear affiliation to Chicago. It's just like, nah, Bruce Hornsby sound drop right now is going to be rad. So let's just do it. It would be fun. It would be really fun if every uh, metropolitan area had its own Bruce. That was some kind <laughs> of... <laughs> yeah, my Bruce is called Billy Joel. <laughs> my Bruce is Earl the Bruce. Uh, yeah, so, is that right? <laughs> yeah, my heart is not so brave. No, uh, I don't think I have a Bruce. My Br Who would Cincinnati's Bruce be? James Brown, maybe. Okay, that's a pretty good Bruce. Yeah, James Bruce. Who would Gotham City's Bruce be? Uh, probably probably Bruce, Bruce, Bruce Wayne, maybe. You think? I think... Uh, Bruce, Bruce so. Wayne, yeah, yeah. probably, yeah, I mean, probably, Bruce Wayne. probably. Yeah. Does he and sing though? Batman, absolutely yeah. no chance. Well, no, no chance. Bruce Wayne. I'm not talking about Batman. I'm talking about I mean, Bruce that Wayne. would be. I mean, I would expect. I mean, can you imagine if Batman's whole thing? Sorry, folks. <laughs> If you'll forgive Batman me, Batman is not in the bear. If you'll forgive me, the Batman is not in the bear. Not yet. That being said, the Batman's whole thing is that like he's not a superhero. He doesn't have superpowers. 
Mofo is super rich and super traumatized and has combined those things into being super excellent at everything, right? Uh, karate, boxing, generally beating the shit out of criminals. Um, somehow, some measure of work-life balance because he could be both both Bruce Wayne and the Batman at the same time. He's he's good at everything. He He's the world's greatest detective. He knows all the languages. He knows all this stuff. You imagine that on t- uh, with all that being said, poor Bruce Wayne was just like tone deaf as hell and couldn't <laughs> sing. <laughs> I bet you the Batman is the best singer out there of all the superheroes. Just he out of prob- sheer force of effort. Yeah, you're probably right. If he wanted to be good at it, he would. Uh, he would buy like the best voice coach he could acquire and then just like put them in his basement until he learned how to be a great yeah. singer. Yeah. yeah, you're right. So, you're right. I think he's probably a great singer. Anyway, the music rips. The editing <sighs> rips on the bear. Uh, the, 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 the soundtrack is just absolute fire. The imagery is absolute fire. All the, the, the setting of Chicago, but specifically the setting of the restaurant world and how the restaurant world is depicted um, is really amazing. And I feel like, I don't know about you, Antonio, but for me, ever since going uh, through the bear and then going to restaurants afterwards, it helps that I'm married to a chef who's a little bit in this world. It would be cool to talk to her about some of this stuff at a certain yeah, point, perhaps, um, uh, to talk to Emily about this stuff. But like, I go to restaurants having watched the bear and like, I can't really be there in quite the same way anymore. I feel like the bear stress because uh, of the way that they depict the restaurant stress. But I also feel when I have an incredible meal I feel the bear love because the bear on top of all these other things that I'm telling you about the bear folks, it's a love story, uh, a boy in his restaurant, you know, in many ways. And then all these other people and the, the love that they have for whether it's the actual restaurant that they work at or this industry writ large or the work and this feeling of purpose. Um, there's a great romantic, epic romantic undertone, I think, to the bear that transcends like, are Ross and Rachel going to hook up? Like there's a tiny bit of that kind of thing in here, but it's not a major piece of this show. I would say it yeah, really Ross is, and Rachel are barely apart. You're they're right. They're barely apart. It's really about longing, right? And what is longing if not love? Uh, and so I think that there's a real um, lovely quality to the bear that is very heartfelt. It is a, it is a show that wears its heart on its sleeve and it's very earnest. It's often very serious. It can be very funny, but it is always really earnest and sincere and heartfelt. And that's one of the most attractive qualities of the show, I think. Definitely. The love language of acts of service is so paramount and so front of mind as, of course, it is the hospitality industry. So the people that are really in their blood and bones interested in doing this at their core, they want to make people happy. They want to make people happy with food. They want to show that they care about other people and that they can take care of other people and that they want this. uh, The word hospitality is right there and it's talked about on the show, but like, the understanding of that and why that is a purpose and why taking care of each other in that setting or otherwise, if we all acted hospitably to one another and we thought of other people's needs and we were interested in those things and we asked questions and we thought about them emotionally, we would live in a better world. Uh, and there's just no question about it. And the bear eats in that realm where hospitality is front of mind, but it isn't usually talked about. In the show, it's not like these characters are so these intrepid warriors, like we have to do good for people. We have to get out there and really take care of them. It's just sort of there. It's like the primary animus for what they're doing, even if it is only occasionally spoken about that they want to take care of people they want to show their love uh, to other their, hu- their other human beings through the food that they create they want to express themselves creatively and have that be appreciated so much of that is front and center on the bear which in and of itself without we're not we're not spoiling anything in this segment but in and of itself, it's just a show about the, the collision of how that plays out in the food world, uh, because it's about a, a, a young man who is a fine dining chef who has achieved everything you possibly can, basically, in that world, from stars to awards and everything on down, uh, is unfortunately called back home because his brother has taken his own life. Uh, and has left his restaurant to him. The restaurant he leaves him is not a fine dining restaurant. It's a uh, Italian beef sandwich shop in Chicago. Uh, but there is no reason why, and we learn that right from the rip of the bear, that that can't be done in the same way that fine dining can be done, with consistency, with appreciation for craft, with attention to detail, uh, and to make it as uh, elevated and as good as possible. And that's what this guy's mission is.
businesses. And of course, that's clashing with all the cultural forces that want the restaurant to stay the same as it was. And they have a lot wrapped up in that, whether it's the characters or the neighborhood that the restaurant is in. All of that is considered. All of that is addressed. All of that is part of the story of the bear. It's fantastic. I just love yeah. this show so much. Okay, and then to circle it back to the Mr. Robot piece, because I think like we're talking about the the earnest qualities of the bear. Um, and I think the storyline, as you just described it, would strike me as like, oh, well, that sounds kind of heavy. And it's like, yeah, it is. It is kind of heavy show. This is a show that deals very uh, strongly, deeply in themes of mental health and exploring wellness and how you treat yourself in addition to treating other people. Uh, and our main character is a really tortured individual in that way. A big point of departure is on Mr. Robot, which Antonio and I podcasted about in its entirety. The main character, Elliot Alderson, is dealing with a lot of mental health issues and is narrating it. You know, Rami Malek's uh, narration is a huge part of the thrumming heartbeat underneath Mr. Robot. Right. Uh, Carmi, who is played by the incredible Jeremy Allen White, uh, who I believe Chappelle, who just watched all of the bear, still will only refer to as Lip. Uh, I yeah. don't think that he's he's willing to. If call you're a Carmi. shameless fan, I mean, if you're a shameless fan and you haven't watched The Bear, I don't think there's any reason not to. You're going to yeah. love the Chicago element, the Jeremy Allen White element, and the element of what you're talking about, which is that there are some very serious and difficult topics, but it's dealt with in such a way that that's not the entire point of the thing, uh, and that there the earnestness really comes through. But continue with the Elliot Alderson, please. Well, I th I think that he is sort of like a reverse Elliot in uh, at least in presentation uh, where. Elliot is really like you're uh, there's a lot that you can observe about his behavior and the quest that he is on, even if he doesn't know what kind of, you know, like quest towards um, introspective understanding he himself believes that he is on. He narrates it. He guides it. Carmi doesn't say shit. Uh, Jeremy Allen White wears his emotions and wears what he's thinking on his face, which is often uh, kind of just like this. You know, he's sort of just like. You know, like he's just like kind of just like in the middle of the stress. He's just like he's like blank slate. There's a great line in The Departed, Antonio, where Leonardo DiCaprio says, my hand doesn't move. It never shakes steady. You know, he's always like in these high stress situations, but he doesn't shake. Carmi, very similar until he shakes, until yeah. he explodes. And so and then he's Wolverine. Health, his mental health journey is explored a lot less, I think, in uh, certainly no narration to, to back it up. Um, dialogue, if you're paying close attention, you can pick up a lot about his, uh, his life story. Actual plot and what's happening and transpiring in flashbacks sometimes, occasionally. But what's happening in the present of the show, you can tell that this is a man who's in over his head. But the primary engine for that is the physicality of the performance from Jeremy Allen White. He is a uh, short king, as mentioned, but he's like ripped beyond belief, uh, like biceps for days. You go to his apartment at one point, I think, is it the season two premiere? Uh, and I don't like this is a show that really takes place in the kitchen uh, for basically the entirety of season one and only starts to kind of branch out into the rest of the world in season two. Uh, and you go to and like the, the show can't even stand to be in his apartment before we're like, we got to get back to the kitchen. Uh, so I think that in the way that like Elliot, superhero, super troubled computer hacker, I think Carmi, superhero, super troubled uh, all star chef, I think are two things that I noted a lot on this most recent rewatch of the bear that I did prior to this conversation. I like that. I like it there. I mean, the thing is, Mr. Robot has this underlying conspiratorial or uh, societal explosion plot line that's going on about that uh, shit isn't here uh, right it's not high but, stakes in that way but there is so like in mr robot elliot and f society the the the, the hacker group Giant. that he's working on are like f society are here to take down evil corp they're here to take down you know uh the the horrible agency that is dominating the world and it's uh it's it's a a, a war that they wage on multiple fronts uh, over the course of multiple operations, like staged operations, tiered operations. And the bear is not that dissimilar in, in the sense that like one of the pleasures of watching the bear is the stress of can this plan come together? There's a lot of plans that need to come together when it comes to opening a restaurant. And I think what the bear does very effectively is it sells 
the danger, it sells the difficulty, it sells the stakes involved for these people, not just these characters, but the people who work in this world, that it is as life and death for them as it is for a computer hacker going up against gun toting shadow government agents. You know, like uh, I think in that way, there is sort of this like pirate ship quality to the bear that's very alluring. Makes it a thriller in some ways. I was going to say, I mean, that it, it doesn't have those things, those conspiratorial elements of those big stories, but there are mysteries in the bear. There are things, as I was saying up top here, that if you're paying close attention, and this becomes clear, especially when you rewatch it, uh, but there are things that are seeded. There are things that are set up that are worth looking at. That are like, why is that character mentioning that again? Why did that come up again? Why are we seeing shots of those three letters? Or why are we seeing this? Why are we seeing that? So there are those things in the bear. You're right. They don't tie into the great grand conspiracy of like stopping uh the yoke of uh whatever chain that is uh connected to humanity at the ends of evil corp whatever whatever that looks like in mr robot depending on the various seasons whether it's ecoin or whether it's your bank accounts or your mortgages or your credit whether it's fight club or not uh, i do think mr robot owes a lot to fight club i don't know that the bear owes anything to things like big night which is a favorite they owe uncle cicero the space they definitely owe uncle cicero we won't talk about that without spoilers but yeah. uh i did th i think it has a lot in common with other uh, products or things that we've seen in the kitchen space, maybe uh, like Big Night, like I said, where there's this element in the bear of the clash between fine dining or the desire to do things like in an elevated way. Uh, and as I said, the local friendly neighborhood Italian beef joint that you've your family's been going to for 30 or 40 years that probably isn't using scissors to cut the green tape that they're labeling the ingredients, if they're even labeling them with the green tape at all. It's very much about the clash between the art of food and the art of fine dining uh, and the reality of uh, where the, the people that are involved in the bear are when we meet them in the course of the show and how they have to adapt and grow and change in order to probably best fit with the direction of the world around them. And that's the fascinating thing to me about it is a restaurant show. It's a Chicago restaurant show. It does not shy away from how difficult that industry is, how difficult that space is. Uh, there one time, one point a restaurant a character goes on a tour of restaurants in Chicago later in the season. It's not made a big deal of, but one of the places that character stopped, it, we just see a note that the place closed. It's closed. It's just like this is uh, and there's a montage earlier in the season about all the restaurants that have closed and everything that's difficult there's also issues of gentrification and of just the changing of the guard uh it, take the restaurant milieu out of it entirely and look at it from a generational perspective that is present in this show about people that feel like they have no sense of purpose that they've been left behind that the way the world has changed no longer includes them in a meaningful way and they have to change to be part of it uh, so all of those things that have nothing to do with the restaurant industry really are played out against that backdrop in such a successful way that the show is so much more than a sum of its parts, even though the parts are in and of itself all stand out. The cast is all really, 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 really good. Uh, like I said, if you have if you watch Shameless and you haven't watched The Bear, what are you doing? Like you're really missing out. You're but in for a treat. Yeah. You'll recognize a lot of familiar faces on the show if you've not seen it, uh, even if they're not necessarily the biggest names in the business or weren't when the show was uh, necessarily created. Uh, these are familiar faces in a lot of respects. And of course, uh, as the show has grown in popularity, there there have been some much bigger cameos along the way as well, too. So I think we can probably expect more of that for season three would be my guess. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, we're we're closing out sort of like our let's sell you on the bear bit right now. And the fact that we're just mentioning the cast now is incredible because like any great show that's worth recommending, um, this is a show that is made possible by its phenomenally written, brilliantly acted cast of characters, whether it's Jeremy Allen White as Carmi or I know this uh, Evan Moss Backrack, I think, is your favorite as as oh, Cousin yeah. Richie. Uh, he's a, he's a, a, he's got a lot going on. Uh, Iowa Debiri, who is, who, this was her breakout, I think, as Sid on this show. Um, she's amazing. She's gone on. She's ha she's in a moment. She's having an incredible moment in her career. All three of these aforementioned actors, Emmy winning actors because of the bear Emmy winning comedy, the bear, uh, which I would like to talk about in a moment here. Um, this is a show that has netted tons of awards attention. If it has not yet netted your attention, then potentially this conversation 
has done that. Antonio, I would like to now move us into a different segment um, that whenever we are doing this, I think flagship TV, and we're trying to like hype up a show that's coming back that you and I are really excited about. What I would like to do is use that as an opportunity to go into a segment that I like to call TV on trial. Yes, it's TV on trial, Antonio. Uh, and I'm not talking about an OJ video. This is <laughs> on trial, Antonio. Yes, it is. TV on trial. <laughs> but, it sounded different that time somehow. Time to put so like a different reflection on trial on the stand here. As I'd like to use these shows as an opportunity to litigate some of like the great questions that are surrounding TV right now. Um, there are actually two uh, significant questions surrounding TV that the Bear I think proposes that I would like to get into on TV on trial. Um, the first one I just want to do really quickly, Antonio. We didn't prep this really, but it was something that came to mind as I was. Uh, there's no no bits. Everything's good. We're fine. Everything's going to be fine here. We're fine here. How about you? Um, the, the the comedy thing. So so the Bear is a big Emmy winning show. It is uh, especially now that Ted Lasso is gone. The bear, I do think, is going to be like filling this void in the comedy space at the Emmys, a huge awards, darling. It's on this very strange cycle where the bear has consistently now across two seasons and now the third season dropped in June. Uh, the third and fourth season, the third coming out on June 27th of this year, the fourth season presumably coming out next year were filmed back to back is what we have learned. So I see no reason why the fourth season won't also be able to meet a June deadline. And because they come out in June, Emmy ballots close by the end of May. So it's the June debuting season one that recently won all of those Emmy awards. Uh, the next and it set of be, Emmys will be for season two. And so on and so forth. So, and like season two, having already seen it, many Emmys locked up, I would like to think. Yeah, uh, yeah. Probably like the same exact ones, uh, yep. I would think. Uh, supporting actor, supporting actor, like all, this is how it's I think there's going to, there could be another, uh, I don't want to do any spoilers, but let's just say Dee Dee could possibly get an award. That yes, didn't, ex that didn't hundred, get hundred, like a one. guest star spot yep. for sure. hundred percent. Um, my mom, Dee Dee? Um, so yeah, it's, Dee Dee Wiggler. It's, not, it's nice that it's Dee winning Dee all of these awards. I certainly throw my support behind all of that. As a comedy, so just in like the TV on trial, so as we start to like sniff around the wonkiness of the categorization right now, right? Like uh, White Lotus, can you really, how long can you get away with telling us you're a limited show? Succession, yeah. what should you be? Are you a drama? Are you a comedy? By and large, and certainly as you were categorized, a drama. The Bear, it's funny. It's really not funny. It is categorized as a comedy. Do we care? Do we care about this? Does this matter? Do you agree with the categorization? Should we just be eliminating this kind of award categorization moving forward? This is the first thing I would like to put on trial. That's the tech. That's the, uh, well, your honor, I am not prepared. Uh, the, <laughs> I'd like to ask for an extension. The, um, yeah, I don't care. I mean, I don't care. I, I don't care about the I, I want to care about the awards like I want to care about the pomp and circumstance. I want to care about them because I know it means a lot to the people who win them. Uh, and so that means something to me because I want to care about those people. They work so hard to entertain us, to create a product for us, to to not only monetize for content in places like this, but just to enjoy. Uh, they fill a lot of our lives with what they do, their creative output, and they work really hard doing it. So I want to like the awards for that reason. But otherwise, I don't care. Like, I, I could care less if this was comedy or drama. I like what you said about getting rid of categories. I'm sure there's a very valid reason that probably relates to some terrible thing Best that hour Howard long used to show. do. Best half yeah. hour show. Limited I mean, it's a half hour show. So I can understand why people aren't saying, well, that's not a drama then, is it? A half hour drama i mean there are so many shows now that occupy this space where they're they're they they are heartfelt they make you cry they're extremely dramatic at times but they're also hilarious i mean ted lasso was a comedy but it was a comedy that wanted to eat in like the drama of the comedy and the emotion of the comedy and the relationships between the characters that had nothing to do with being funny so that part of it is always interesting to me it's like the best comedies use comedy to get that pathos uh it's much easier i think to uh stab someone between the ribs if you tickle them first right if you open it up a little bit uh, i mean so yeah I but like i guess wow 
Uh, I never really thought of that as a tactic. Yeah, tickle them and then stab them. Yeah. You never did that? No. Oh, well. I always forget you're not Italian. The uh, <laughs> the, rea- the reality of the situation, though, though, is like I do think you can get a lot of emotionality out of comedy in that way. Get people to let their guard down and then you punch them in the face, uh, yeah. whatever that is. Uh, and I think the bear does that extremely well. The bear would be terrible if it wasn't for the comedy. And so much of the drama of the, and the fighting and the yelling is often played for comedy. Uh, there's at the beginning of the episode at the fourth episode of season one that I know you love so much. Uh, Richie and Carmi are just fighting. They're just fighting in the parking lot, and it's funny that they're fighting. They're fighting over like an inflatable hot dog. Yes. So fighting and the anxiety there is for comedy, but a lot of the time it isn't. Uh, And part of why I love the bear so much is that it wears both hats extremely well. So I really don't care if it's nominated as a comedy or a drama because I think it is both of those things, and it does incredibly well at delivering both of those things. And I think it only does because of that yin yang relationship, because of the. Uh, the oppositional force of comedy and drama and the way that those two things play out on the bear, it's magic. They just do such a good job with it that I don't care what it's nominated as. I really don't. And honestly, I don't think they're gaming the system to get more nominations. I think it's hard to decide what kind of show this is. Yeah. Uh, I think it'd be really fun to have a longer conversation. Emmy nominations are not terribly far away, uh, about a month away. So I think we'll talk about those more when when the Emmy nominations come out. I would just love to talk about like the state of uh, awards shows would be a very fun conversation. Okay. Usually California, I think. uh, So that's, (laughs) so that's sometimes New York. Uh, So that's thing one. Uh, thing two for TV on trial. <laughs> yeah. You're fine. 50 cents. Every time you play that every TV time. on yeah. trial. Yeah. Uh, you just keep pushing the button uh, and you never know what's going to happen. We'll make some money eventually. Uh, I think <laughs> um, Antonio, I think a conversation that we are going to be having a lot on this podcast uh, in which this podcast's canvas is television. Yeah, we're talking about the state of TV, the evolution of TV, the history of TV, the vibes of TV across the evolution of TV. That'd be a good audio book. Yes. Uh, Write write that down. Uh, Put down uh, the evolution of TV. Great audio book. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, The binge versus the weekly drop here in the streaming era. uh, This this is a this is a very big conversation that is happening uh, in uh, you know our specific water cooler here in the attic right now, but it's happening around all of the water coolers that all of you have as it pertains to your television circles. Um, should this show be released weekly? Should this show be dumped in all one shot? Should all shows just adopt one model? How do you determine? How do you decide? Certainly as a content creator, I could tell you a weekly drop is a lot easier to plan for and historically has been a lot easier to plan for than a binge drop. The binge Binge drop has confounded the content creators of how do we talk about this? Do we do it episode by episode? When do we talk about this? When is appropriate? Because everyone now is able to watch at their own pace. How do we do this without spoiling for people? So it's been a huge existential question that we've been wrestling with offline. Uh, You, me, several others on the We Know Scripted Beat, on RHAP writ large, our friends at the old post-show recaps who have moved on. It's a huge question that as podcasters we've been trying to answer is the weekly versus the binge. And I think the bear is such a fascinating data point in this conversation because I am a fan of the weekly, not just for the reasons that I have outlined uh, as a as a creator of content for your listening pleasure, but also because I love the space between. I not the Dave Matthews song. I love like the the. You do beat. love that too, though. I, I bet. do love that song. Forty one is yeah. better though. Uh, like I love like the moments in between the episodes where I can be thinking about the episodes and talk about the episodes and not knowing what's coming ahead and really letting it live uh, as part of my life over the course of a couple of months. And normally, I would be inclined then to think like, "Gosh, I wish that was the same for the Bear." It's such a rich, meaty show. There's just so much to drill into. I would like to pull it apart strand by strand, thread by thread, episode by episode. But at the same, like over the course of like a long period of time, but at the same time, and this felt especially uh, clear to me on this rewatch. God, this is a great binge show, Antonio. This show is a really good argument for the best merits of a binge drop. What do you think those merits are? I I had a couple things I scribbled down in advance of this conversation that binge that the binge drop favors generally yeah, shorter I episodes and seasons, shorter yeah. episodes and seasons, faster pace, 
uh, like a page turning plot, something that's going to keep you hitting play on the next episode. Uh, and then you said, what about a show that's poorly written? I think, <laughs> a, binge, I think a binge favors yeah, a poorly I do. written show because you I don't do. linger with it so much. Yeah, I think a binge does favor a poorly written show. I think a poorly written show that's coming out week to week has a much harder job ahead of itself than a poorly written show that is dropped in an entire binge. Because you have the like you've gone through two episodes and you've decided that Ozark, I'm sorry, that any show that you would be watching in this specific How example is bad. But you now have six episodes that are already waiting for you. So you're kind of just like, ah, oh, fuck it, whatever. I'll just keep playing. You know, like I think that you can get away with the um, I think you can get away with a decent impression of a good show on bin uh, in binge mode than in in a way that you can't on weekly because you have to like it's appointment TV is one of the things that weekly has to sell you on. Like if we're going to be stretching this out, we got to make it worth your while. You have to come back every week and it's got to be pretty reliable, if not great. Uh, and I think that with a binge program, you can hide that more. You just like dump out the, the content. You just like spill it out. And you're like, here's here's some toys. Play with them. And you're starved of playing with toys. And so now you just want to play with the ones that have been dumped in front of you. Yeah, I think the binge rewards mediocrity in a way that weekly, like mediocrity has a much harder uh, road on uh, a time delayed release schedule. I think that's true. I think we have to be careful not to then overlap some of that. Like uh, definitely most or all poorly written shows would be better as a binge, but not all binge shows are poorly written or Correct. not all shows that work well are poorly written if they're a binge. And I think The Bear, as you said, is this example of a show that is a binge show and probably should be uh one of the problems with binge shows is they don't often break through into the consciousness because they're here and they're gone yes they break through right they break through for like seven days or for a week or for 10 days until the next thing happens and then the next thing is what's talked about and people don't talk about the show anymore so uh, a show like fallout should have been released week to week and yes. wasn't uh, and everybody watched it and talked about it for like a week or 10 days. And then Baby Reindeer came out or whatever. And everybody talked about that. And then the next one comes out and you just you all you, for, fall out has no lasting cachet. That show, if it was a weekly show, I think it would still be airing from when it from when it started airing. So it would have been part of this ongoing weeks to months long conversation about each episode, about the things that were happening. And surely that show would have built more momentum and buzz as a result of it. But I have a feeling that they nowadays, a lot of networks love those first seven days numbers and they love like the, the to get the viral conversation in the moment and they don't care if it gets lost. And Netflix is super famous for this, obviously, even though they are uh, when it comes to their flagship shows have no problem uh, screwing around with the release schedule. We talked about how Bridgerton gets split up into two spaces offline, but that happens. Of course, Stranger Things is dropped in different chunks, uh, but I, I would argue that that was really effective and worked really well, uh, that it wasn't week to week, but it also wasn't entirely a binge. There was that hybrid model that for Stranger Things, that particular season worked incredibly well. What I have to say about the bear as far as it being on trial as a streamer versus a binge show, or sorry, as a binge show versus a week to week show. Uh, is that the creators of the bear? I think know that it's all dropping at once, especially this at is, this point. Yes, this is such a big point uh, because I, I'm I'm nodding along and totally agreeing with everything that you're saying up to this moment, except that there's like the one, and I'm sure it's blaring in your mind as well. Is like, but the artistry, right? Yes. You know, like uh, you know the, all the reasons that it makes sense for the network or for the streamer or for whoever to those seven day numbers. Ah, oh, mm, those yeah. delicious seven days numbers. Mm, I love them so. They taste so good. <laughs> Right. No one so who's like, making this stuff actually feels that way. Ted right? like, Serendos was that your Ted Serendos impression? Yeah, was, yeah my yeah, he was, he was yeah, uh, he's Reed, a union man. Reed Hastings yeah. is that your Reed Hastings impression? Union man, Ted Serendos. Uh, that he like these these people they don't they don't care about the craft, they don't care about the quality, they care about the raw data, and so for the raw data junkies, like I totally get it. But what really bums me out is when someone made a show for i guess I'm, I'm trying to think of like what would be a really good example of this um someone made a show expecting that it would have that sort of like weekly long rollout and then netflix bought it and netflix only does it as a, a dump and so like the episodes weren't written toward the binge the episodes weren't written with that format in mind this was a big controversy actually i believe with the boys season two I think is when the boys, uh, the boys season one was dropped in a shot. 
And then the boys season two is where they got into like a little bit of a hybrid into full on weekly format. Um, they dropped the first few episodes and then it was weekly. And there was a big uproar about that because people were expecting to be able to just watch the boys in a shot this time around. I think uh, for season three and certainly for season four, the boys is like written knowing that it's going to be a week in between episodes dropping. But for that second season, I don't know that that was the case. And this has happened before. In the case of something like The Bear, to your point, I do believe The Bear is being written and conceived and created knowing that we have to deliver all of these episodes to the people at once, which means we are crafting that full season narrative in a very tight, cohesive way that is benefiting from people being able to just reach the end and then go back and see how much was baked in from the jump. Yep. And that the bear is is rife with that. I don't know if we want to talk about spoilers, but there's so much in the bear that even on it, not even on a rewatch, it just feels like you're pre watching sometimes where you're watching something, as I said earlier, and it's like, hey, KBL electric. What is KBL electric? I keep seeing and hearing KBL electric. The, the characters keep asking about it. And it's not a thing where they're like, it's a whole episode segment about it where somebody is like doing research on the Internet. It's just a random question that happened to be in one scene in multiple different episodes or we just kept seeing it by the end of the season we know what kbl electric meant we know what it is and we know the significance of it the same thing happens in the second season with the refrigerator door uh multiple times throughout the season it's like hey did you call the refrigerator guy did you call the handle right. guy when you re-watch the show you're like oh my god like this was all in there this was what the show was about this whole time but it was also about all these other things so i really wasn't tracking that refrigerator door thing and i should have been because there it is oh my god uh but there's other things like that there's times where a character Character will tell a story like uh, Carmi will talk about in season one. He talks about how when he staged at restaurants, he would show up and and if new guys showed up where he was already there, then he had to prove that he was better than them and faster than them and stronger than them. And that's what he would do. He would just push all these people out and he wouldn't even see him as people. He would just see him as competition, just people that needed to be run ran over. And then in uh, in the second season in Honeydew, when Marcus goes to when they're when they're in Copenhagen, uh, we hear the story about how uh, Luca uh, Pip. Uh, he stodged somewhere and he basically just says without naming names like I worked at some place and I, I really wanted to be the best guy and then I worked somewhere and I realized that there was this other guy there who kicked my ass and I wasn't the best guy and then in an unrelated other later episode in season two you just see a picture on the wall in another restaurant and there's Luca and there's Carmi. So Carmi told the story in season one yeah. without naming names. The second person of the story told it in season two, again, without naming names. We put the button on it in the background of one scene for three seconds later on in season two. The show does all sorts of stuff like that uh, that really do pay off if you're sitting there and you're investing in what happens. Characters in the modern day will reference conversations in season one uh in season one they're talking about these things that happened in the past and then we see them in season two we see the past moment when that happened we see a lot of that so the show is very aware of where it's been and where it wants to go and how it's getting there uh, and it is invested in putting those things out there when you watch them in a binge i think it's much easier to pick up on them when you're re-watching or cycling through the first time through though I don't know. I do feel like week to week, Josh, if we were podcasting, I like to think we would be saying like KBL Electric. What's up with KBL would Electric? We yeah. definitely would be. And it would be a great like it would be a great show weekly. Like it would be phenomenal. Gosh, a lot would change. Like if we could be talking about the bear every single week. I don't know what we'd be doing. Would we be would we be weekend programming right now? No show recaps would, we, would still exist. Would we just be bearing down? I don't know. <laughs> Bear down for midterms. Bear down for what? Bear down yeah. for midterms. Yeah. yeah. Uh so I, I'm not I'm not sure. That was for you, Mulch. Uh so I don't I don't know. I think um I, I definitely think it would be great on the weekly, but another argument, not just in terms of like the tight plotting, that can be done on weekly as well. But one of the things that I think makes the bear so conducive to that binge drop is that it is reflective of um, like the, the core anxieties and stressors and feelings of the show when it's at its most agitated. Like there is this feeling of these characters and Carmi specifically, but Sid as well and Richie and all these people whose fates are tied to the success of the restaurant are in it, inescapably in it, that even when we do leave the restaurant, like I said, you go to the apartment for five seconds and then we have to go back home, like and home is the restaurant. Um, so we leave the restaurant 
and when we do, it's for like a restaurant tour elsewhere, or it's to go to a different city where another restaurant is prominently featured, or it's to go to another restaurant to train a character, right? Like we're still in that world. There is something really claustrophobic about the bear, I think is a word that I would use to describe the vibe of the show when it's so stressful. And I think that the binge if you're doing it in that model, if you're basically sitting down, if not watching it in a single chunk, then at least watching it in like several big chunks at a time, you're going to undoubtedly just end up feeling what the characters of the bear are feeling as well. So yeah. it's almost like this, like, I don't know, 5D is smell of vision, right? I think yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. So like, I don't know, like there's some smell of vision, there's some taste of vision, there's some sweat of vision. Uh, that I think comes out from the bear being dropped in that format and you watching it in that intended way in kind, you become closer to Carmi, you become closer to Sid, you become closer to Richie, you become closer to the plight of the people who have family members who are sick and who are dying and you are working your ass off to bring in money to help those people. But when you leave their bedside, all you do next is go to the restaurant and you're there all day. And when you're done at the restaurant, you go back to the hospital. And like, this is the life of one of the main characters on the show, basically. And I think that like the binge viewing of it really helps you stay locked into the fact that like this show, this world that you're inhabiting is their life. Uh, and that there are so many people out there in our world, in reality, who go through very similar things. And so I think the binge model for the bear, the more that I've reflected on it and the longer away I've gotten from, uh, from season two specifically, where I was really wishing it was weekly. Um, the more I feel like that binge is the attitude that binge yeah. is the bear. Yeah. I, that was really well put. I, I would say it's like an amphetamine that the bear is like speed. It's like, uh, it's, it, it, it it's something that it makes has you to, feel. It can't go under 50 miles per hour. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, otherwise the restaurant explodes. Otherwise the restaurant explodes because Dennis, Dennis Hopper Hopper's, Hopper's head pops off. It's all, this it's all fucked. Evil yeah. plot. Yeah. Um, no, I just, I think it is, it's, it's, it, there's a vibe to it. There's an energy to it and that there's a propulsive nature to it. And I think a lot of that would be lost if you were slowing it down, going to week to week. Obviously, the weekly format favors things like theories and lore shows where you're really sitting around thinking about theories or or the lore of the show or thematic shows like Mad Men, where there's a lot to sit with as far as what the implications of a particular uh, scene or series or, or moment or episode have on a character's life and the decisions that they've made previously, what it reflects about where they are in their journey. Those heavily thematic shows, I think, benefit letting you sit with them. Similarly, shows that have like massive plot like gut punches do that right you you want to sit around with that for a week or so uh, because you want people talking about it and if it's a show that has those sorts of things uh these big moments like an episode ends with a character unexpectedly being killed oh my god like that's the kind of show you want to have happen on a weekly release because you want people to sit with that in the same way that you're talking about right where if you're binging the bear you're sitting with what it feels like to be part of uh the lives of the people that are in the bear uh sometimes when shows like want you to sit for a week and just think about what just happened uh rather than live in the lives of these characters and in the moment and live with the, the drama of that very moment to really sit with it uh, i think the weekly model favors shows that encourage moments like that uh but um, shows some shows as you pointed out uh, some shows really thrive uh, having a longer time in the discourse too it just gives the show a longer time to be talked about to be uh, discussed to be part of people's uh, knowledge what's happening yeah. I will say the bear is one of the rare streamers that I think has a tale that outlasted its shelf life as far as how long it took people to watch the first season I don't know if it's because people were finding the show repeatedly through memes and through social media and I do wonder if social media sort of like obliterates some of this uh, because like succession was a week to week show on HBO and I think weekly viewers like as of the moment not out 30 days but like weekly viewers i think the peak was like three or four million dollars or three or four million viewers an episode maybe as many as eight or nine if you tack on all the extra views or whatever and that was a show that goes week to week if that show hits netflix and people start memeing it and putting it on the spaces that it wasn't before 
a lot more people are going to watch that show than three or four million people or a peak of eight to nine million people. So sometimes a show that can get into the conversation in different ways can outlast or outlive or just outperform the model that it's part of. And I do think the bear did that. It is unlike other streamers. I think it's one that sticks with you in the social space, whether it's jokes about the hot chef or your rat boyfriend chef or uh, whether it's memes like tying a uh, Carmi screaming into I think you should leave memes right. about 55 burgers, 55 fries. The bear has found a, a, its way to pierce through uh, a lot of the noise and stick around longer beyond its uh, initial run. So that's another thing, a point in favor of the bear. Maybe the weird Emmy season helps it. Uh, maybe it's just the Jeremy Allen White being hot and being somebody that people want to talk about helps. that helps it. All that helps. All that, that helps. helps. All right. Well, Antonio, I think that that is it for TV on trial. We're doing more TVs on trial as the weekend program continues. But before we close out here, two things. One, just to tell you now what it is we are doing in the next episode of the weekend program. We're going to stay on the bear for one more week. Season three drops on Hulu on June 27th. On the June 29th episode of the weekend program, Antonio and I are going to be talking about the very first episode of The Bear Season 3. So that will have spoilers through the Season 3 premiere of The Bear, but nothing further than that. And we will use that as an opportunity to have like deeper conversations about the characters, some other fun things that we want to get into in terms of like the show's depiction of the food industry and a couple of other shenanigans that are planned along the way. Hey, maybe even a special guest uh, for next week's uh, weekend program. Would be cool to bring somebody else into the attic, Antonio. Oliver Platt? Oliver Platt, you heard it here first. <laughs> HAP. That's thing one. Then thing two. Um, and I let me let me vibe check you on this, Antonio. This next bit. Spoilers, no spoilers. Ah, uh, spoilers. Okay, so if you have not watched The Bear yet, your homework is go watch The Bear. Go watch The Bear. You'll be through it in a weekend. It won't even take you that long, probably, to watch The Bear. Once you pop, it's gonna be hard to stop. Check out The Bear. Be ready for the June 29th episode of The Weekend Program where we're going to talk about the season three premiere. And at some point in the future also, we're going to talk about season three in its entirety, but not right away. So you've got some time. Season three premiere, Bear Appointment TV next week on The Weekend Program. Leave now if you have not watched that show because what we're going to do now here, Antonio, is we'll talk about it in a little bit more spoilerific detail. I think specifically by doing some episode rankings. We'll do a really quick episode rankings and use that as, a, as an amuse-bouche to some of our more spoilery takes on the bear next week. Sound good? Yeah, this won't be long. Let's just name some episodes. We'll we'll kick it back a little bit, but let's lay the groundwork for where we're going to go with this conversation going forward by uh, for bear fanatics, for bear fans, uh making clear where our bear love lies. Yes. Uh so this was this is this was great for me, by the way, to go back and rewatch the show and to have the uh the exercise of trying to rank the episodes in mind as I was rewatching it for a couple of reasons. Reason number one is I have to deliver an episode rankings article to the Hollywood Reporter at some point in the next couple of weeks. So this was extracurricular for me. This was great. So you doubled down is what you did. No, double down. But I have to watch all of season three and then incorporate those episode rankings into my current episode rankings that exist through season two. And I'm not going to have like that benefit of time to go back or like the recency bias. Like, is it going to be like a ton of three at the top or at the bottom? God forbid. So I don't know how the episode rankings are going to look, but right now I'm really happy with my episode rankings. The other thing that was very clear to me is like the worst episode of the bear. Is This was how it was with succession too. We ranked the succession episodes and like the worst ranked episode of succession still absolutely rocked uh that is for sure the case here for with, you uh with with the bear where like every episode of the bear is great uh i agree with that some episodes of the bear are really like so so for me i have one that's unranked and if we're in spoiler zone now at this point i have fishes unranked antonio this is for yeah. the people who've seen it and don't remember them by titles this is the hour long this is the longest episode of the show uh is the hour long holiday at uh the bear residence uh where we get jamie lee curtis showing up as the drunken mother john mulaney is there oh. gillian jacobs is there sarah, sarah paulson. paulson is there bob odenkirk bo is there uh Oliver, they, Oliver all, 
they better have called him, and they did. Yeah. Uh, Bernthal's Bernthal. back, and he's yeah. so good. At it. Um, I've watched this episode once, and I, I don't know that I can ever watch it again. Uh, it really is just so stressful, um, a little too close to home for me for reasons that I've poured my guts out on podcasts before, and I'm going to exercise. Mom's also named Dee Dee. Uh, yeah. but uh, too close to home for me. So I Fair couldn't enough. revisit it on, uh, on, on this watch through. So like, I don't want to call it my least favorite episode of the show. I guess it is. It's my least favorite episode of the show. My top five, but I don't think it's the worst episode. And I think that to your point, yeah, there's a real argument that it's a, a, a maybe like the best episode of the show, but I'd never want to watch it ever again. Um, so every episode otherwise is like just unbelievable and really, really great. And my top five, I'm really happy with. Uh, All right, how do you want to do why don't you kick us off? What's your what, what? What did you decide was the fifth best episode of the bear? Well, I guess the way that I would do this then is that don't I ask think me how I want to do it and then do it your way. Yeah, well, well <laughs> you asked me about the top five, and like my top five. five my five, four, and three are all siblings. And then uh, my top two are siblings, I think. Uh, and so I guess they're cousins. It's like two chunks of cousins that we're dealing with. It seems very appropriate, does it not? Yeah. So I think mine have mine have a little bit of a theme as well, uh, at least on some level. When I looked in my notes, I have the same name on the top five episodes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my top five uh, would be and let me just get the names of the episodes as well. So my top five in fifth place, I have Sunday, which is Sid's big Sunday out where she's going from restaurant to restaurant seeking inspiration. Season my, two, episode season four? two, episode three. Oh, yeah. uh, my uh, my fourth ranked episode is season two, episode four, Honeydew, when Marcus goes to Copenhagen, the aforementioned mm -hmm. episode. And love a hangs, day out, it seems. Hangs out with Adam Warlock uh, and learns yep. pastry from a guardian of the galaxy. And my third ranked episode, uh, which I feel like has potential to be your top ranked, uh, maybe, or it has your top ranked scene in the whole show. Uh, Forks, season two episode seven yep. when richie goes and finds his purpose he stages at a three-star michelin restaurant and learns that he's good with people and that carmy really does love him yes and the, the scene where he's uh you know driving and like powerfully triumphantly blasting taylor swift uh is utterly iconic it's my favorite sure. scene in the whole series either, yeah. either season and I get that, but what I had forgotten because I hadn't revisited this episode was that he also, in like the montage that this is a part of, he Hadoukens. Yeah, he does. Hadouken! Oh, yeah, yeah he when just he guesses like, the he just like apple cider streak or whatever. Full on Ryu Ken Street Fighter vibes. Hadouken! Like he yeah. just, and, and what he does also, I think he like punches the yeah, air. Yeah, he does so it. He does it. A, he does like the, yeah, the, the dragon punch. punch. It's a totally yeah. different move, which is yeah. so richy. Uh, so great. So great that he conf uh, he conflates the, the Hadouken with the dragon punch. Um, so those three, I think, are all linked, right? They're like, uh, adventures outside of the restaurant, very big moments of meaningful discovery for all three of Sid, Marcus, and Richie. Um, my top two episodes of the show, uh, the second one was almost number one, and the top one is the one that takes the spot. And the way that they are linked is on the, on the matter of stress, on the question of stress and anxiety and how much you love that from the bear. Is that what you're looking for from the bear? Because it makes you feel that in such a guttural way. Or are you here for the bear for like the moments of overcoming adversity and the many moments of triumph that, that stack part. and build that heart at the center of the show? And ultimately, that is the thing that wins out for me. So my second place episode, which was almost my first ranked episode, both of these from season one. Uh, it is season one, episode seven, Review, which is a triumph of television making, uh, you know, all presented in a single take. I don't I haven't done the deep dive to know how like once it starts in that direction. Anyway, there's you know, a whole montage at the start of the episode. But once it starts in the restaurant, you're in the restaurant on a line. Part of why it's such a short episode and the fact that it's so short is a, a small mercy uh, because you are just in hell the entire time you are watching that one and it's immaculately rendered. But why would I prefer to watch that when dogs is right there? Uh, yeah. So season one, episode four, that, that episode that does begin with Richie and Carmi beating the shit out of each other through an inflated hot dog. Yeah, just as a episode, goof. The episode in which they uh, accidentally spike the ecto cooler with Xanax and make everyone in the yard go to sleep. And Oliver Platt says, oh, I'm kind of into it. 
<laughs> yeah, great work. Preston makes them feel good. You know, there's lots of great lore that's built into that episode. There's really good stuff with like Sid and Tina in that episode. There's just so many great small moments that really add up and equate to everything that I love about the bear. Everything that I love about the bear is on like perfect display over the course of dogs. Uh, so uh, yeah, dogs number one. So those are my five. Uh, my five are, uh, again, it's Sunday, Honeydew, uh, nothing to do with Butson, uh, Forks, Review, Dogs. Those are my top five, Antonio. Not bad. Uh, not bad. Interesting choice for number one, I think. Although it is in my top five. Two of your five are in my five. Uh, I will say, uh, just that by means of explaining my list, I feel the same way as you, that so many of these episodes that like sum up what we love about the bear, uh, it's so easy to see as the episodes that really stand out and make us remember them. But that said, there are those kind of moments in basically every episode of the bear, as you were saying. So if you love the bear because it's funny, every episode has some humor in it, I feel like. If you love the bear because it punches you in the gut and it makes you upset about uh, these memories that the characters have about their family or one another, uh, or these horrible family moments, every episode's got that. If you've got like overcoming personal adversity like that is at the front and center of so much of what each character is dealing with throughout whether it's Sid with Sheridan Road uh, or whether it's Marcus with what's happening with his mother in season two of course we know what Richie and Carmi and Sugar are up to uh, throughout so uh, there is so much of that adversity uh, built into the story and for me <clears throat> the moments where character characters overcome it uh, or are not defined by it uh, really stand out. So my uh, fifth episode, as far as my top five, is the season one finale, uh, Brashol. Uh, both, it's a great episode because it's a great finale to that first season. But I also love the monologue from Carmi and Alan on there where he really lays bare everything that motivates him. And it's stuff that I think he hasn't even been willing to say to himself throughout the course of the season. If you follow that arc with self-help or his willingness to talk to people at first, his sister in the first episode is like angry at him because he won't go to the thing. We don't even know what it is. Later, we find out it's Alan on. Then Carmi starts going. And now Carmi is like really participating and bearing his soul. And it seems like it took him the whole season to do it. And as far as season long arcs go, there's another great payoff with Richie in that, uh, that where he gets arrested because he fought somebody at a bachelor party. He thinks the guy's going to die. So is he going to call Tiffany, his ex, uh, the mother of his child and ask about being bailed out or tell her about the situation. And we remember as an audience, if we're invested that earlier in the season, Richie is lamenting the fact that his daughter thinks his last name is bad news yeah. because that's how he's listed in his wife's phone, Richie bad news. And she says, every time you call me, you got bad news so he's in this horrible situation where he could really use some support uh and really use like hey i i am in a bad spot i just need you to tell me it'll be okay and so he doesn't call her and give her the bad news when he calls her he leaves a very heartfelt message he apologizes it's like he's cognizant of what he's been in this person's life and in his moment of desperate need he does not choose to put himself out there he chooses to say like i'm so sorry for the way i've treated you a massive growth for that character obviously more growth to come in the second Second season but i love that i of course had dogs fourth uh from one of most of the reasons that you said but again there's so such good richie content in this episode we hear about why richie and cicero are at odds with one another we find out ultimately in this episode that it was because of mikey it was because of mikey's yeah. drug addiction and what i love about the show and as someone who has had members of my family really struggle with addiction and it's an issue that has touched my family way closer than i wish it would have Same. Uh, i know what yeah. it's like to live with this in your life uh, and so when i hear about like the way that other characters within the bear have these massive issues with one another because of mikey's drug addiction their their relationship is toxic because someone else that they loved and knew together uh, was toxic. And so they got that all over them and it affected their relationship. That Richie and Cicero stuff comes out in dogs, but it comes out with Pete and Carmi and dogs in the same way. Uh, when Pete is basically saying like, hey, I really love you, man. Like, I really respect you. I was just so in, in admiration of everything you did. And then Pete's like, yeah. And, and, and while sugar, he's tripping really, on Ecto Cooler. While he's tripping on Ecto Cooler. Yeah. Uh, but she, she says sugar really, you know, she was so into it too. And Carmen's like, I guess I owe her a call. And Pete's like, yeah, we're like 50, you yeah. know, like, you know, not for nothing. But she went through a lot, too. Like, even in those moments, like Pete is willing to stand up and say that. So I love the character of Pete. I love dogs for that reason, because Pete plays a significant role in it in the way that Pete does. Uh, Fishes is my third. 
Uh, I know and 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 respect the reasons you said. I hate the film Uncut Gems. I was telling Mulch this before the podcast. Yeah. It has that energy, right? Where there's just like constant noise, constant anxiety, constant fighting, shouting, screaming, constant tension. And there are these moments where the characters will go outside or they'll one on one. They'll talk to one another. There's a very meaningful conversation with Carmi uh, and what I believe is meant to be like a cousin uh, played by Sarah Paulson. Uh, if we're not if not a cousin, we could just say it and get away with yeah, it because it's sure. fair. Um, it's just so I really love that John Mulaney being in that episode is so funny. Uh, Lee Lane, Uncle Lee is referenced in the beginning of season two. He's the L and KBL and the characters are like, oh, God, Uncle Lee. Oh, no. And we're like, oh, God, what's this guy going to be? And then it's Bob Odenkirk and he is a colossal asshole. Yeah. Uh, just a massive gaping asshole on yeah. fishes. So that I really love that cameo. I, I the episode has grown on me. I couldn't stand it at first. And now, like, I, I just really see in that episode. Uh, why they wanted to do that episode. It wasn't just to make us feel bad. It was to inform us so much about the relationships between these characters. We see a conversation between Richie and Cicero in that episode that is referenced in Dogs. It's referenced later on in the season two finale. This is a massive moment in these characters' lives we just happen to see in that moment. So I really like Fishes. Uh, season one, episode six series is my number two episode. Uh, again, this is a massive Richie episode. Uh, and I think that's what's really in common with all five of these episodes for me are they are really centering around this character i love him because he's broken i love him because he is raw and he is rough around the edges he is not this perfect person because in the real world those people are few and far between the perfect people we're all rough around the edges we all have stuff we need to improve upon and we all have moments where we fear the world is leaving us behind or we need to change uh to fit in with the world around us we cannot shape the world to our desires anymore uh and i think the richie character really plays out on that in series he has a great monologue with sid where he's basically saying like our neighborhood is an ecosystem and these things are closing and changing and the ecosystem is evolving and i don't like it because the people who rely on this neighborhood to be what it is need it and inherent in all that is like that's his purpose and his place is that neighborhood how it existed then and it's changing and he can't control it and i love the way that episode ends uh the the, the toughs that are on the street that richie swore earlier in the episode don't insult me i'd never call the police on you sydney deals with them she yeah. bribes them richie has no role in it and he feels completely useless and at the end of the episode you see the police arresting them or rolling up and you see richie seeing it happen you don't even need to have seen him make that call to know that he made it and to know why he made it. So I that episode always lands for me. It also begins with that fantastic scene of the monologue describing the series statue where we first meet Mikey, having heard about him a ton, as John Bernthal in the flashback scene. We see Richie as Richie, like so beta and secondary and not loud. He's so happy and, and just innocent and sweet in that scene. And it's just a very different performance than the Richie we meet later. And you get an idea of like what happened when Mikey Bear was removed from these people's lives. Everything fell off for Richie. So I really, really love series. The only thing that tops it is Forks, which was on your top five for all the reasons you said. Again, just a, a great Richie episode and a great episode. Carmi is still struggling with this through two seasons of The Bear, finding a way to like find your purpose and not have it fuck up the rest of your life. Yeah. Uh, and Richie finds that in Forks in a way that like immediately he actualizes. He's helping Sugar in the restaurant. He's turning the napkin around uh, and he's helping her find the right front of house people to catch stars. And then he his bravo uh bravo moment in the finale uh where he steps up and sydney basically the second my second my second best moment of the show when she says richie drive and then the music yeah. shifts from that horrible kid smoke wilco stress song Spiders, from season yeah. one to animal by pearl jam and richie just houses it it's so good uh so i absolutely love uh that episode uh it forks it's just it sets all that up. It sets Richie's upswing. And and honestly, it's much needed. I remember when this first premiered, I remember uh, Mulch uh, did not did not love the Richie character, hated the character and said something to the effect of like, hold on, this is hard time. slander. We've got Mulch right here. Mulch yeah. bringing you in. Mulch hated Richie true? and then she loved him were, after. Were you after a Richie fourth. hater, Jess? I she really, was. I really could not stand Richie. I, he, he got under my skin. And such Antonio, just way. tell me when you need me to pull her from the stage. <laughs> never, never. I understand that. He's he's an abrasive dude to begin the show. Yeah. And there isn't much to find that is redeeming in him. And I think it's a real lesson. And like, don't give up on people like there, there, there is something in him that Carmi 
either knew about because he was family, because he loved him, uh, or he sensed. But he's just don't give up on this guy. I'm not yeah. going to give up on this guy. And in not giving up on him, in finding ways to like put him in a position to succeed uh, and and really uh, elevate. I mean, I think he he does that, and I think it's a really positive message. It is very funny though, Jess. I, you say he's so abrasive, he gets under your skin. I think they acknowledge at the beginning of season two. I joked about this earlier, but when he says, "I haven't said G or R in a week," yeah, and he's like really proud of himself, right? Like he's uh. super proud of himself you know yeah. that's richie to a t uh for yeah, sure honestly forks is such a lesson in how to redeem a character i've never had gone from absolutely loathing a character to the point where i was like i hate when he is on my screen like i actively hate him to oh my gosh this guy <laughs> like by the yeah. end of an episode so quickly so quickly it what they did is incredible they just they dimensionalize him so well in, yeah. in that episode so. it, and, it, and it starts earlier on and yeah, I, I, I definitely i know oh, you kicked chess out i definitely don't blame anybody eventually. there's really no graceful way to do it that's a fair point yeah. uh I, I i i don't blame anybody for having any issues with richie in season one but even within early season one when he and sid go to buy the caulk when you first learn that Richie has a daughter and he's trying to be there emotionally for her when she's going through a tough time. And it's like, alrighty, this guy is a different guy than you thought he was even like five minutes before that. And already you're like, okay, now I, maybe I feel a little more sorry for this guy. And there are a couple of those moments in season one where you learn a little bit more about him and you're like, okay, this is there. It wouldn't be anything without uh, even Moss Bacharach's performance, obviously. And it certainly wouldn't be without the writing, without the way the show is edited. But that story, at least through the two seasons, has popped so well and the arc is like seemingly pretty complete like yeah well so see, then where do we go look there's two more seasons at least that yeah. have been uh ordered and filmed uh so uh he's pretty high right now which does make me very concerned for where the show could be taking yeah with the we got jamie lannister there uh in a hot tub with brienne in season three right and then by season five he's uh raping his sister in front of his dead son <laughs> in fairness that was season yeah i think it was season four i thought it was the beginning of season five either way um yeah, he redeemed him and then they brought yeah, it they, they ripped him yeah. back so yeah. rishi's going to be back to grr at the beginning of season three if we're not lucky and if we're lucky he'll just be a good guy who can maybe help some of these other characters find their purpose in the way that he found it which seemed like he was beginning to do at the end of the yeah. second season especially with fact i love richie and fact's relationship and he's there for fact now he's like you're you can be brave you can do yeah. this you got this man like he's he's now pumping fact up and when you've done that with the way that those guys were like where do you even have to take richie at this point he needs yeah. to just take his wedding ring off but other than that like he's he feels like he's, did you he's know done. actually that uh brian cox is a huge fan of the bear did you read that <laughs> no this feels like a setup but every go episode he turns off he says back off <sighs> began it with crimes and we're ending it with crimes is that how we're doing this this Walter, week i'm bringing you back in how did that <laughs> Mulch will take you back out. <laughs> uh, well, I think we need to begin the process of facking off here. Yeah, let's do it. Let's this back is off. an opening shot at the bear. Tried to do it almost completely spoiler free until this last little bit. So uh, wanted to get into like the like the spaces in between, like the stories and the particulars and the characters and everything that really make this show sing. And then next week we'll get more into that when we talk about the season three premiere. At some point after that, after we feel like an appropriate amount of time has passed. We'll devote a weekend program to a fuller discussion of season three of The Bear at some point this summer. So stay tuned for that. Make sure you never miss an episode of the weekend program when you subscribe. Rob has a website dot com slash subscribe. All of the information is there for We Know Scripted TV, the YouTube link, the podcast store. All of it. So make sure you go Rob has a website dot com slash subscribe. Your ratings and reviews are so appreciated. We would love to see that from you if you have it in you to write those things. Uh, very helpful as we are at the still early stages of this brand new podcast adventure. And of course, we would love to hear from you in our email uh, weekend program. R.H.A.P. at Gmail dot com. That's weekend program. R.H.A.P at gmail.com, Antonio. Yeah, if you have any overarching questions about the bear that aren't necessarily related to season three uh, or won't get into spoilers, if you just want to talk about the bear, if you have any thoughts, uh, feel free to shoot them our way.
Yeah, you can always just send us an email. You never know when we're going to email you back. Might not make it onto the show. Uh, so feel free to send in that email, weekendprogram, rhap at gmail.com. If you've got anything about the bear and you want to hear from Antonio and I, uh, we we always love to hear from all of you about all of the shows that we are doing. Um, so we do this thing where we each send, where we, when we reply to an email like that, we t- we each type one letter at a time. So yeah. I type a letter, then you type a letter. <laughs> take, I type a letter uh, letter. Actually, he's being modest. Uh, he's right hand, I'm left hand. That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you wipe. Uh, why you wipe? I get, yep, or I get A-S-D-F-G. You yeah. get H-J-K-L semicolon. Uh, that's how we spread out. Shout out to the semicolon crew. Yep. It's sort of like uh, the like the the key like the computer keyboard equivalent of heart and soul, right? You know, like one of us plays the chords, one of us does the solo. Yeah, I I like that. That's all I got. Anyway, all right. Weekend program, another one in the books. We'll be back next Saturday here in the attic of RHAP for another edition of the weekend program devoted to the bear. Until then, take care and back off.